thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's start this. Okay, so of course we can talk about uh, RL in many different ways. Uh, but what I was hoping to do in this lecture is to give you really a bit of the fundamentals, the basics of, uh, you know, classic reinforcement learning uh, algorithms that can hopefully then later uh, help you better understand, you know, the more modern uh, deep RL uh, algorithms that you might hear more about uh, tomorrow. And also, I'm hoping that uh, to, to cover a bit the sort of pros and cons of the different classes of algorithms, as well as give you an understanding of when you should be using uh, one or the other. So let's start with uh, you know, uh, the, import the most important question, which is uh, what is reinforcement learning and why do we care about it? So the way I think about reinforcement learning is really a science of decision-making. So uh, it's, it's going to tell us how an agent can optimally take actions in an environment in order to maximize its, its total future reward. Uh, so the idea is that uh, in uh, reinforcement learning, the agent will be learning through trial and error by interacting uh, with this environment and by uh, getting feedback and learning from the feedback that it receives uh, from the environment. Uh, so whenever you have uh, you know, some kind of uh, objective function, some kind of like metric that you care about optimizing in the long, long term uh, by taking different actions, that's when you may want to use uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, and what kinds of problems can we use uh, with uh, RL? So you, you probably know, you know, uh, RL has seen uh, a lot of great success in a wide range of uh, domains from games, right? So We've had, uh, you know, agents that have learned from scratch to uh, play uh, very difficult games that are even very challenging for humans, such as chess, Go, uh, StarCraft, Minecraft, and many others. We can also use RL to control robots to teach them how to walk, uh, potentially, or how to manipulate different objects. It's been, uh, you know, uh, DeepMind recently uh, and Google Brain have recently shown it can be used to design chips, right? So that can help us to automate and find much better uh, sort of like chips uh, than uh, having to design them by humans. It's been used to control plasmas in uh, nuclear reactors or fly uh, helicopters or stratospheric balloons, uh, you know, as well as uh, people are now trying to use them uh, in self-driving cars uh, to control power stations or even manage uh, sort of investment uh, portfolios. So it's really uh, what I'm trying to get uh, through, through this slide is to show you that it's a very, very uh, versatile uh, te technique that can be used in many different uh, domains if you can, you know, apply it in a successful way. Okay, so what makes reinforcement learning uh, unique and how is it different from other areas of machine learning that you might have heard about uh, in the past few days, like supervised learning or unsupervised learning? So a few things that makes this uh, problem quite different is the fact that the agent collects its own data, right? So we don't really give the agent the data to learn from. The agent has to go in the environment and collect it uh, itself, right? So that means that, uh, you know, basically the better the agent is at, at collecting data, the better data it will have to uh, learn from, right? So that's a very important part of the reinforcement learning uh, problem as uh, we'll see uh, later. Of course, the data is sequential, it's not IED, right? Uh, uh, in contrast to other supervised learning methods, uh, you don't get direct supervision, right? So for example, in, you know, image classification, you get your image and you also get your label. Uh, but in reinforcement learning, you don't get to know what's the right answer, right? What's the right action in a particular state, but rather you have to learn from this uh, reward signal that you get from the environment, right? So the environment might tell you, oh, you know, uh, you did something good or you did something bad, but you don't know exactly, you know, when you did the good or bad thing, right? Because you might have uh, delayed rewards or the actions might have very long-term uh, consequences. So you need to figure that out uh, which makes this quite a, a quite a challenging problem uh, in comparison to supervised learning and uh, other uh, fields. Okay, so you know the the way we define uh, the environment, right, is uh, through the help of Markov uh, decision processes. So the idea is that you know the reinforcement learning uh, environment can be defined by uh, these MDPs, 
where you have uh, S, which is a set of states. Uh, and uh, here, so uh, the set of states for now, we're gonna consider it's a finite set of states in order to simplify a bit uh, the problem. But of course, this can be extended to continuous state spaces uh, and so on. Hopefully you'll hear a bit more about this uh, in the lecture tomorrow. Similarly, we have uh, A, which is uh, the set of actions. Again, we'll, for now, we'll assume it's a finite uh, set of actions. We have this uh, P0, which is uh, an initial state distribution, as well as uh, P, which is the transition function. So that will give you basically the probability of the next state given the current state and action, as well as the reward function, which similarly, it will give you the sort of like expected uh, reward given uh, the current state and the action taken by the agent. And finally, we also have this uh, discount factor, which uh, basically what it's going to do is going to, what we're gonna say is that we're going to discount rewards in the future. So we care a bit more about immediate rewards than future rewards. And that's also gonna help us a bit with the sort of like math to not run into, not have to deal with like infinite uh, rewards and so on. So hopefully that's uh, clear. Uh, and now I just wanted to sort of define some of the important uh, metrics uh, in reinforcement learning that we're going to see on and on uh, throughout uh, this lecture. So first we have this notion of a return, uh, which is this like GT quantity defined here, which is basically the total discounted reward from time step T, right? So you see that you have, uh, you know, the, the immediate reward that you get at this step plus discounted of the next reward and uh, so on, you're going to discount more and more the future rewards. Then we have uh, this policy, right? So that's going to tell us what's uh, the agent's behavior in this uh, MDP, in this environment. And here, uh, you know, we just basically, it's gonna give us a probability distribution over all possible actions given the current state. Then we have the, the value function, which is a very important uh, quantity in uh, RL, which is the expected return starting from a particular state S and then following uh, policy pi. Similarly, we can define a Q value function, which is the expected return starting from state S, taking action A and then following a certain policy pi. And finally, sometimes we can also think about a model, right? Which is going to give us a prediction of the environment's uh, next state and reward. So we're going to try to model these like transition and uh, reward functions. And the idea is that uh, what we're going to try here, right, is to find the optimal policy, right? So the policy that maximizes this uh, return. And we're gonna, going to see, you know, many different ways in which we can do this. Okay, hopefully that, that was uh, clear. And uh, just wanted to go over, you know, the few, you know, the different ways in which we can categorize reinforcement learning algorithms. So first we can think about having, uh, you know, value-based algorithms. So here the idea is that we're only going to try to learn and estimate a value function. So there's no, I, no uh, explicit uh, modeling of the policy. We're going to derive the policy from the value function. Uh, then we have policy-based algorithms, right? Where uh, this is like the opposite, right? We're only going to try and model the policy and we don't necessarily uh, care explicitly about the value function. Uh, next, we'll, we're going to look at some uh, actor critic algorithms where we hope to model sort of like try to combine the best of uh, both worlds. Uh, and we're going to model both the policy and value function and use them in a way in which, uh, you know, helps the agent uh, better learn uh, the policy. So that's one uh, sort of categorization of uh, these uh, algorithms. Uh, so based on whether they're modeling uh, the value or the policy, and then we can also categorize them based on whether they're model free or model based, right? So here, what we mean by this is that uh, model free is, uh, you know, it's just like uh, you, you learn the policy and their value function, but you don't have to explicitly learn a model of the world. Whereas model based, you you learn the policy and eventually using this, oh, sorry, you learn the, the model of the world and using this model, uh, you can uh, then also find the right policy and value function. Okay, so that's just a, a diagram uh, sort of like uh, summarizing what I just said uh, in this like different ways of 
uh, different types of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. Okay, so one uh, sort of like important piece of this, which again is gonna help us uh, figure out how to find the optimal policy uh, later on, is this idea of uh, the Bellman equation, right? So what is this uh, Bellman equation? So here what we have is um, basically what, what it tells us is that the value function, right, of a certain policy can be decomposed in two parts. So you first you can uh, have like the, the immediate reward, and then you have the discounted value of the successor state, right? So you can kind of like show it, you know, by just uh, using the definition of the value function, which is the expected return of uh, this policy pi, you can sort of, you know, show that it can be decomposed in this way. Uh, and we'll see how, you know, this is a very important uh, relationship and we'll see uh, immediately why. But yeah, just important to, to keep in mind. Okay, so uh, why, you know, uh, I mean, again, here, right, we see the decomposition of the value function. And similarly, you can show that the Q function, right, so the uh, the sort of like the, the value of a certain state and action can be decomposed in a similar way, right, using the, uh, so basically what, what this means, right, is that the value uh, at a certain state, right, you can take a step in the environment, see what reward you get, and then uh, based on the estimates on that next state that you find yourself in, you can uh, sort of like update your initial uh, value of the initial state that you started from. Okay. Uh, okay, so what this gives us is that uh, basically this allows us to have a linear equation uh, which has a closed form solution, right? So we can uh, sort of write this uh, down, right? So we have uh, the value of a certain policy will now depend on our uh, transition uh, function and also on our reward function. So basically, if we know uh, exactly what the transition function and the reward function that we have in our MDP, in our environment, then we can directly compute our uh, value of the policy at all possible states uh, in the MDP. And of course, that's gonna later help us to derive the optimal policy. Okay, the problem with this is that it can be quite expensive, right? So it's, uh, you know, order of n cubed with, uh, with respect to the number of states in the MDP. Uh, so this makes it feasible, you know, only for fairly small MDPs, right? We can only compute this exactly when uh, the number of states uh, in the environment is not very large. However, we'll, we'll see that we can also find uh, sort of like approximate methods for large MDPs. So uh, we're going to look at uh, what Monte Carlo evaluation is, dynamic programming, and also temporal difference learning, which are very classic uh, sort of reinforcement learning algorithms that will tell us basically how to get this uh, value function, even when we don't, we cannot compute this exactly. So we'll have to sort of approximate it by interacting with the environment. All right. Um, you know, very similarly, we can uh, define uh, the notion of an optimal value function. So here is uh, what this means, right, is the value uh, is the maximum value function over all possible policies. So as we've said, we care about finding the optimal policy that maximizes this value in the environment. And similarly, we can define the optimal uh, Q function, of course. So note that here, uh, basically, and basically, you know, you can uh, sort of like also write this down as a function of the re reward uh, reward function of the environment and the transition function in the environment. However, as you see, right uh, here, you have this max uh, for the value function, right? You have a max operator over the Q function, so that that's going to be a bit uh, more difficult to compute than the Bellman expectation equation that we've seen uh, for evaluating the value of any given policy. Okay, so yeah, as, as mentioned, right, uh, this Bellman optimality equation, right, so the way we find the optimal value function in the environment is nonlinear, so it's not going to have a very simple solution that we can just write down. Uh, but again, in the next few slides, I'll show you a few different methods like value iteration, policy iteration, Q-learning, and SARSA, which will help us approximate this, uh, this quantity. Okay, so uh, one more thing, right? So uh, we're going to have 
you know, we're going to look at different classes of algorithms, right? For now, we're in model free RL, right? So there's no, we're not trying to learn any model of the world. So we're, what we're gonna, going to, to do is first, if we have a known MDP, so if we know the reward function and transition function of this MDP, we can use dynamic programming, which I'll explain, uh, you know, in the next few slides to directly solve for this and find the optimal policy. Uh, whereas uh, if we don't know this MDP, right, what we have to do eventually, right, we want to optimize uh, the value of an unknown MDP to find the optimal policy. Uh, but before that, right, we'll, we'll kind of like use what we call model free prediction, which is uh, this idea that we'll need to learn to estimate the value functions of uh, various policies uh, in uh, this unknown uh, MDP. So I just wanted to stop here for a second for if there are any questions on sort of like definitions or like uh, these different uh, concepts that I covered before moving on to, okay, if there are no, no questions, maybe I'll, I'll move on. Uh, let's see. So, so, okay. So let's, let's begin uh, with, uh, you know, the, this problem setting where we assume we know the MDP. Uh, again, this is going to be a bit of a simplified setting, and in the real world, of course, we don't know exactly, you know, how uh, the transition function and like reward function of a certain MDP, right? So we'll have to approximate, but let's start uh, by uh, trying to understand this first. Okay, so again, uh, the idea here is that we're going to assume full knowledge of this MDP, and we can use dynamic programming uh, to plan uh, in this MDP, so we can either use it for prediction, uh, where what we're trying to do is to basically estimate the value function of a given policy in a given MDP or for control where we're going to try and uh, basically find the optimal value function and optimal policy, right? So that's eventually what, what we're trying to uh, get at. Okay, so just for a bit of intuition here, right, how, how this is going to work, and I'll explain in, in more detail exactly how the, these algorithms work. Uh, is that, uh, right, so basically what we're trying again to do is to find these value functions, right? So you can imagine the agent is at state ST, right? And we want to find the value of this state. So how can we, how can we do this, right? So one method is this dynamic programming uh, backup idea where basically what we say is that, okay, we're in this state, uh, ST, we can take, you know, the agent can take all sorts of different actions, right, given by its policy, uh, so we can sort of sample from the policy to get uh, to the next state, right? Based on the actions that it takes, you know, it gets various rewards like RT plus one. And then it finds, uh, the agent finds itself in a new state, right? ST plus one, where we may already have uh, sort of like an estimate of its value function, right? So that's this uh, VST plus one. And we know, right, this is basically the Bellman expectation equation, right? That tells us how to update the value at the original state where the agent started based on uh, you know, the, the, the immediate reward that it gets plus these uh, sort of like the value at, at its next state, right? Uh, and the important thing to note here, right, is that here we really need to compute this expectation with respect to the policy pi and the environment, and, uh, your uh, MDP, right? So that means you're going to average over all possible, you know, the average basically according to your uh, policy and also the transition uh, matrix, right? So that's gonna tell you, you know, what are all the possible states uh, the agent will find itself in uh, given a certain action. And that's going to allow you to compute this expectation. And importantly, you can only do this when you have, uh, you know, full knowledge on the AMDP. So you know exactly the reward function and transition function. We won't be able to do this, you know, in the more general case, but we'll see how we can approximate this. Okay, so uh, here we have, you know, the, the way we're going to do this, right, uh, is by, uh, you know, one, one way is uh, through this uh, policy iteration algorithm, which essentially what it does is that it's going to alternate between two processes, which are uh, policy evaluation and policy improvement. Uh, so basically you're going to, uh, you know, first, you start with some, uh, you know, estimates of your value function for this, uh, for some policy that you have, and uh, you're going to, you know, try to even better estimate the value of your current policy, and then you're going to try to improve the policy, you know, 
uh, with respect to the value that you have. And then you alternate between these, uh, these two stages until you converge. And it, it can be shown that this converges to sort of like the optimal value and policy, at least in tabular settings. So the idea is that uh, you know you just you try to get a better estimate of your policy, then you try to improve your policy with respect to that estimate, and so on until you find uh, you know the you found like the the actual uh, value of this policy. Okay, so I'll, I'll just go a bit quickly through this. So you have policy evaluation for policy evaluation. Again, we'll use uh, the Bellman expectation equation that basically tells us how to update values of states. You know given uh, the previous iteration of uh, these values. And for policy improvement, we're uh, simply going to take the greedy action, right? So we're going, we can look at all the actions. Uh, we're in a given state. We can look at the value of all possible, uh, you know, next actions that the agent can take and then say, okay, we're going to take the action that maximizes our uh, value function. Okay, so that's just a diagram that hopefully can help you understand a bit better what's going on here. So again, you start with a certain value and policy. You can, you know, initialize them however you want pretty much. And then you're going to first try to, uh, you know, update your value uh, using the Bellman equation for this particular policy. Now that you have a more accurate understanding of the value of this policy, you can try to uh, sort of like take greedy steps, right? So really optimize this policy according to the value. And then you, you keep doing this until you converge. Okay, similarly, uh, we have what's called a value iteration class of algorithms. So here you're trying to directly find uh, the optimal value, which will give you the optimal uh, policy. So there's no sort of like... Uh, alternation between evaluating the policy and uh, then improving the policy. What you do here is just continue to improve uh, the value uh, using the Bellman optimality equation, right? So here you're really just trying to make the value better and better uh, using what we've seen uh, before. And again, this can be, it can be shown that this converges to the optimal uh, value V star. Uh, but again, you're you're only going to compute an actual optimal policy at the end of this process. You don't need to like compute a policy at every single uh, step. Uh, I'll stop here again for if you have any questions about uh, dynamic programming. If not, uh, I I guess I'll I'll move on to to model free uh, prediction. Okay, so, so far, right, we've, sh we've seen that, uh, how we can deal with like known MDPs. And now what we want to do is uh, try to figure out how we can deal with MDPs where we don't have knowledge of uh, their reward and transition functions, right? So we have to kind of like interact with these environments to uh, learn these value functions uh, and optimal policies. Okay, so uh, one way of doing this is what we call uh, Monte Carlo learning. So Monte Carlo methods, again, we're going to learn directly from uh, episodes of experience. It's model free. You don't need to know uh, basically the, uh, the MDP in order to use these methods. And importantly, it learns from complete episodes, uh, which I'll explain in a bit, uh, you know, uh, exactly what, what this means. But the idea is that you need to kind of like roll out your policy in the environment until the end of the episode in order to estimate uh, your returns. And uh, what this means, right, is that, of course, you can only use them in uh, sort of like episodic MDPs. So, uh, you know, uh, in like a, this episodic uh, MDPs, right? So if you have a continual MDP that never ends, right? So you can have, you know, a robot that, uh, house, household robot that, uh, you know, constantly tries to do various things. There's no notion of, you know, here's where the episode uh, ends and where, you know, you basically get a new, uh, trial at, uh, at, uh, this, uh, at solving this particular task. Okay, so again, for, uh, for an idea of how this works, so here we're going to have a, a slightly different way of updating our values, which uh, basically is, uh, the so you start at state st, then the agent can take some kind of action. It finds itself in a new state, st plus one, then it takes another action, finds itself in a new state and so on until the end of uh, the episode, right? 
uh, and basically, if you if you do this right, you can uh, measure the the return of this episode, right? So the expected uh, total uh, discounted reward, and then you can use your you know current estimate of the value at this state to update you know your your value. So you keep doing this to get better and better estimates of the value of the state, and that's going to help you to to estimate things. Uh, and again, uh, important thing to note, right? So in uh, in contrast with dynamic programming, here you cannot really look at all possible, you know, next actions and states to compute these values. So that's why you kind of have to go on one path, which is, you know, uh, just uh, uh, given by the policy and the MDP with which you get to interact. And uh, that's gonna help you update the values. So it's quite simple, uh, but of course it has uh, a few, a few draw drawbacks. So, for example, as as we mentioned, right, uh, it um, one problem with it is that you have to wait until the end of the episode to update your value, right? Which can be a bit inefficient, right? A bit slow, uh, and overall uh, slightly uh, annoying. So, a somewhat better way of dealing with this is uh, what we call temporal temporal difference le learning or TD learning. So, here we have uh, you know these TD methods again; they're quite similar to Monte Carlo approaches where you learn from experience, uh, they're model free, but importantly, they can learn from uh, incomplete episodes uh, through what we'll call uh, bootstrapping, right? So the idea here is that you don't have to wait until the end of the episode to update your value function, and you can kind of like update it after every single step uh, that the agent takes in the environment. Uh, so the way this is going to work, right, is that you start at uh, state ST, the agent takes some action, it receives some reward, right, based on that action, uh, RT plus one. So it finds itself in a new state, ST plus one. And of course, we know kind of like from uh, the Bellman equation that uh, we can sort of like approximate the value. We can try to uh, sort of like get it to be closer to this uh, new updated value, right? So now that we've seen the immediate reward plus, you know, the value that we have at the next state, we can update our value function of state ST towards uh, this quantity. Okay, so, uh, you know, just for more uh, sort of like clarity, that's that's our update. We're going to call this uh, the TD target and this the, the TD error. Uh, and in contrast, right, the important thing to note is that in contrast to Monte Carlo updates, where you need to wait until the end of the episode to get your return here you can just update your value function uh, after a single uh, after taking a single step in the environment so that's a bit more convenient uh, so to recap the sort of like differences between these two classes of methods uh, with td learning you can learn before actually knowing the final outcome right so be, before knowing exactly what's going to happen uh, you know at the end of the episode and you can also learn without actually knowing the final outcome. So you can learn from these kinds of like incomplete uh, sequences, right? So you can kind of like always update your value functions uh, at any given state if you just take one step in the environment. Okay, and now let's talk a bit more about the differences of uh, these two classes of methods, right? So we have what's called this bi bias variance trade-off, which I assume you've you might have seen in uh, previous lectures, but what does it mean here, right? So what it means is that, uh, for example, this uh, this return that we're measuring is actually an unbiased estimate of the value function. So that's, you know, ideal. It's kind of like what, what we're trying to get at. Whereas uh, the TD target that we use in TD learning is actually a biased estimate of the value function. But the nice thing about TD is that this will have lower variance than the return. So in practice, it might actually end up being a bit more convenient. Uh, so basically, you know, the, the intuition of why the TD target has lower variance is the fact that uh, with TD, you only take, you know, the only source of randomness is that one action that you take in the environment, whereas with uh, sort of like Monte Carlo methods where you have to roll out the policy until the end of the episode, you're going to have like, you know, basically randomness from every single action that you take in the environment. So that's going to lead to uh, higher, you know, higher variance of uh, this estimate, right? So it's a bit of a, you know, trade-off between these two. Uh, again, you know, just to recap, right, Monte Carlo has high variance, but zero bias. 
So uh, that's going to uh, mean it has good convergence properties, even with function approximation in some cases. Uh, it's not very sensitive to the initial state, right? Because you, uh, you know, basically because of the uh, unbiased uh, estimate that you're using, it's quite simple and can be uh, quite efficient in non-Markovian environments. So uh, basically, what, okay, so what a Markovian environment means is that the next state, uh, as I've explained earlier, it only depends on uh, current state and action. So that's a, a bit of an assumption that we make. And there are, of course, extensions uh, to non-Markovian environments. But basically, because MC rolls out the policy until the end of the episode, you know, you get to see the entire future. So you don't need to necessarily make uh, this assumption. Uh, in contrast, you know, TD has uh, low variance and some bias, but in practice, it can be more efficient than uh, Monte Carlo methods. So it's used uh, quite a bit more, I, I would say, in practice. TD0 also can be shown to converge to the, uh, you know, the actual value of the policy. It's a bit more sensitive to the initial value, right? Because you uh, sort of like update uh, your values based on other estimates of the value. So if you start with poor estimates, you know, you might get stuck a bit in a sort of like a local uh, minima uh, and can be more efficient in uh, Markovian environments because it makes explicit use, right, of the idea that uh, value at current state, uh, you know, only depends on, on like value at uh, the next state and not necessarily the entire uh, history. Uh, but, uh, you know, it can potentially be a bit uh, less efficient in uh, non-Markovian environments. Okay, so just again to, to visualize these uh, different types of algorithms, we have Monte Carlo backup, right? So again, you have to roll out your policy until the end of the episode, uh, compute this uh, return and update your values. With uh, TD learning, you can update your values after, after every single step by using, uh, you know, sort of an approximation of the uh, Bellman equation, right? So the idea that you can update current state based on uh, the, the, the value of uh, the next state. And dynamic programming where you need to have full knowledge of the MDP, right? So in order to take this uh, expectation, right? So basically looking at all, pos all potential futures, right? That the agent might find itself in and then update uh, the value according to that. And uh, just to give you a bit more understanding of these uh, different notions we've covered, right? So we have, uh, you know, what, what, what is this bootstrapping idea, right? So bootstrapping means that you're going to, your update will involve an estimate. So that's what basically TD uh, and dynamic programming use bootstrapping, right? So you're using the value at the next state to update the value of the current state. Uh, and then you also have like, you know, sampling, right? Which means that uh, you update samples, uh, uh, an expectation, right? So in this case, right, you have uh, kind of like uh, TD and uh, Monte Carlo sample, right? Because you kind of like interact with the environment to find, to update your values. Whereas dynamic programming doesn't, right? Because you just assume uh, you kind of know how the future will uh, look like. So that's a way of thinking about, you know, these different types of, um, uh, these different types of algorithms, you know, along these two different axes. Okay, and, uh, you know, so basically, you know, we've seen that uh, the TD target, right, that for TD zero, what you do is that you only take one step in the environment and then use the estimates of your values at, after that one step. But of course, we can sort of like generalize this idea and assume that we take you know, two steps or three steps before we use the value uh, at that point to update, uh, you know, the value at the state where we started from, uh, right? And at the very end of the spectrum, right? So here we have kind of like TD0 and here we have Monte Carlo where we basically roll out uh, until the very end of the episode and don't need to use any bootstrapping. So we don't use any uh, kind of like, inter like estimates of the value function uh, at intermediate points. So that's a way of generalizing this, right? So you can basically write down this end step return, right? Uh, where you take uh, n, n actions in the environment, right? And you actually look at each of these different uh, rewards that you get. And then uh, after those end steps, you use your uh, value estimate at that state to uh, compute uh, this end step return. So, you know, th this is just a generalization of uh, TD learning using the end step uh, return. And again, uh, TD0 co corresponds to, you know, 
n equals one, and basically Monte Carlo corresponds to uh, n uh, tends to infinity. Uh, and one nice thing uh, is that uh, you know people thought like, well, I don't know, you know, which which one of these uh, n step returns I should be using to get my estimates. And uh, as we've seen, right, there's this bias variance trade off, so it's a bit unclear which one you may want to use. So one uh, one way of basically learning from all of these uh, sort of like n step returns is to essentially uh, like uh, compute this weighted average of uh, the n step returns. So you have different weights for each of them, where you know all of these weights uh, sum up to one. So then you can get your, what's called like the lambda return. So that's gonna have like slightly nicer properties and uh, works better in practice because you essentially just learn from more types of uh, updates. So you can sort of like reduce, get a better trade off between uh, variance and bias, especially as you kind of like, uh, you know, carefully tune this uh, lambda parameter. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, what leads to TD Lambda. So again, same update, but different, uh, you know, instead of your return or, uh, you know, n-step return here, you use your Lambda return. All right. So again, I'll stop for a second here uh, to see if there are any questions on this part. No questions? Okay. Uh, okay. One question. Uh, yeah, I think it's, yeah, you, I don't know if you need a microphone or. Okay. Um, just, oops. Um, wanted to know a couple of examples where you could uh, approximate them as model free or model model free control or model free prediction. Like the dynamic is cool, but model free. Just like real examples, real world examples. Uh, did we do model free control? Uh, so we haven't covered model free control yet. I'm going to that next. Okay, so for model free prediction. Okay, um, okay. So basically, so model free prediction and model free control are very, sort of like close to each other. Um, so the idea, so in model free prediction, what you're trying to do is really evaluate the value of a certain policy, right? So you assume you have some kind of agent, you know, perhaps you have, uh, you know, an agent, let's say playing some uh, Atari game, right? So it's just kind of like takes actions in the environment, you know, it does what it does. And the idea is like, how can we tell how good that policy is, right? So based on, uh, you know, given that, uh, the agent has a certain function, right? That tells it, okay, in this state, you take uh, this action, right? Um, it's basically gonna tell us, okay, how good is this policy? And then in model pre-control, right? Where, what we're going to try and do is to learn the optimal policy, right? So really the idea will be to try and given some kind of value for a certain policy, try to optimize that, right? So find the optimal policy. I don't know if that, uh, that clarified uh, things. But are those approach really used in real world? Uh, sorry? Are those approach used in real world or just like approx like theoretical concepts? Yeah, I would say, okay, so these are more like classic algorithms. Uh, they're not necessarily used, I'd say, uh, a lot these days in the exact form. But actually, you know, what are, we are hopefully going to see tomorrow, right? Or if you look at... Uh, the modern uh, deep RL algorithms, you're going to start seeing that they look very similar, right? The, you know, the main difference is usually that you use a function approximator like a deep neural network, but actually these equations, right? Like the Mel Bellman equations or things like that are gonna look exactly this, you know, very, very similar to these, right? So the way you're going to update your value uh, to, improve, uh, to improve it, uh, it's gonna look very similar. I think, yeah, in the next few slides, I'll cover things that are a bit more like SARSA and Q-learning, which are a bit more, you know, actually telling you how to find uh, the optimal policy that you care about. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to ask, uh, when we use the uh, Monte Carlo methods, we usually use them because we can early prune the inconvenient states. But here you said we need to uh, finish the whole episode to uh, have the reward for Monte Carlo. Does it mean we need to search the whole tree? And is it convenient to use the Monte Carlo methods when they lose their most, well, the biggest advantage we 
which we are interested in usually? Yeah, so I guess you don't necessarily have to search, right, uh, as much as you sample, right? So you just, you have your policy, you have your environment, and basically just roll out your policy, right? So sample from your policy, see what uh, comes up in your uh, environment and do that until uh, the end of the episode. Uh, but, you know, as, as you're pointing out, this is not usually the most efficient thing, right? So it's not that much used in practice as is. And what's used in practice much more is the, you know, kind of like the TD Lambda or variants of that that I've shown uh, before, right? So this kind of like interpolation between something like TD Learning and Monte Carlo updates where indeed, as you're saying, you know, you don't have to go, always go all the way, uh, you know, until the end of the episode and you can kind of like, you can make updates as you take, you know, one action or two actions uh, in the environment. Uh, the idea is that you're just going to sample that a bunch of times, right? And that's going to give you an estimate of the uh, return. And do we then use some early pruning or do we just have to finish all the steps to see? Uh, so again, right, you, you, can, uh, you can prune things, right? You can stop uh, doing that uh, with TD learning, yeah. I guess with classic uh, Monte Carlo, not, not necessarily, right? Uh, because you need, right? That's how you still need a value, uh, to an estimate to to estimate the like the full uh, uh, full return. Thank you. All right. So if there are no more questions, let's see. Uh, you know how we can use uh, these ideas to actually do control and find our optimal uh, policies. Okay, so again, here, uh, we're not only going to try and estimate the value functions, but actually optimize them. Uh, so we're going to try to find the optimal policy that maximizes uh, return uh, in this environment. Okay, uh, you know, similar to, to before, right? And uh, perhaps maybe this is helping out with, uh, you know, the, the previous questions in terms of applications, right? So some of these, uh, algorithms, at least in the past, right, have been used for a whole bunch of uh, different uh, environments. I think the, the main thing to point out here, right, is that these algorithms are still only work in finite uh, MDPs, right, so where you have finite states and actions, so you can actually, you know, list down all your states and then have a lookup table for, you know, for every given state, uh, you can have your, you know, your value estimate at that point, and then you can kind of like keep uh, updating these things, right? So I think that's the main, uh, really the main difference with like, uh, you know, more modern deep RL methods uh, where you can have, you know, infinite uh, number of states and so on, very large MDPs. Uh, but still, you know, some of these problems can be uh, basically uh, formulated in this uh, finite MDP uh, type of way. So if you don't have that many states and that many actions, you're you're kind of good to go, even with these classic uh, algorithms. Okay, so just to recap, right, this idea of uh, policy iteration that we've seen before, uh, that essentially uh, alternates between these two different processes, right? So policy evaluation and policy improvement, right? So again, uh, you have your policy, you try to estimate its value, then given that, uh, you know, most recent estimate of your value, you try to generate a slightly better policy and kind of like keep doing this until uh, you get to the optimal uh, policy and value function. So we'll see how we can instantiate this in a more uh, general way. Okay, so here, right, uh, as we've seen before, right, we're going to use this idea of Monte Carlo control. So every episode, right, the way we can evaluate our policy we've seen is by just doing Monte Carlo rollouts, right? So we roll out our policy, we see what kinds of rewards it gets in the environment, uh, compute our returns, and that helps us, you know, that directly gives us an estimate of its uh, Q function, right? So we can do that for a given uh, state and action and uh, then update our Q functions. And then we can have our policy improvement, uh, which uh, means that we're going to, uh, you know, I guess this is called like epsilon greedy policy improvement. So instead of just greedily always taking the very best action according to your value, what you're going to do is to sometimes take some random actions. So uh, that's going to help you to, you know, make sure that you get good uh, Q function estimates, right? So Q value estimates for all possible actions and not only, you know, the, the ones that uh, your policy directs you towards. And that's very important, right? Because uh, otherwise, if you're not exploring your environment, you're, you're likely going to be very stuck in a local minima and uh, you're not going to be able to uh, solve this well. Sorry. Um, oh, 
okay so right so basically you know that's how, how this is gonna look like so it's quite similar to what we've seen uh before with this like policy iteration algorithm but here you don't have to you know fully uh like figure out basically what's your exactly evaluate uh, your policy at all possible states so you can just do updates of your uh, queue function after every single episode as we've seen uh, previously and similarly of course we have uh, you know what's called like uh, td control uh, also called sarsa and this is a very popular and like kind of well known uh, classic uh, rl algorithm so the difference uh, for this one is that you can do updates again at every step, step rather than having to wait until the end of the episode. So the way you're going to evaluate your policy here is slightly different, right? So you say your agent starts, starts here in state S, takes some actions, uh, receives some rewards, finds itself in a new state S prime, uh, where you know it decides to take uh, a different action A prime, all of this according to its current uh, policy. Right, so here uh, the way you can update things, right? So, so you can update your uh, Q, Q values, right? For uh, the state S and action A that uh, you have right here based on, you know, something that's uh, very similar to what we've seen before, right? So just using kind of like the Bellman equation uh, decomposition, right? So we know this should go towards the, the reward, right? The next reward that you see plus the discounted uh, Q value of the next state and action. Uh, and for policy improvement, again, I mean, you can use different things, but for the most part, you can use something like this uh, epsilon greedy policy. So, you know, you either, most of the time you take, you know, the action that's best according to your Q function, but sometimes you also take a random action so that you explore the environment a bit more and you can update, uh, you know, Q values for states other than the ones that directly try to uh, maximize your policy. Okay, similarly, I won't really go uh, deeply through this, but uh, you can uh, compute end step uh, SARSA just like we did with uh, end step uh, returns. And, uh, you know, you can have SARSA lambda like uh, TD lambda. So it's essentially the same, uh, the same idea. The only difference really is here that uh, the SARSA algorithm helps you to decide really what's the best action that you should be taking, right? So because now you're uh, optimal, you know, you're estimating these Q functions rather than uh, value functions, then you can basically look at this for each state, you can look at this Q function and say, okay, out of all my actions, what's the action that maximizes this Q function? And that's gonna directly give you the policy with which to act in the environment, right? So the better we sort of like optimize this Q function, the better our policy will be. And uh, basically the more return we're, we're gonna get and uh, that's how we're going to get to, you know, uh, close to the optimal uh, policy. Um, maybe I'll just stop here for a second to see if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, so again, so all of this, so everything we've seen before uh, was mostly like on policy algorithms. So on policy or off policies, again, another useful uh, sort of like categorization of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So for on policy, what we have is that we always update the policy that uh, we're using to interact with the environment. But, uh, you know, there's also this like class of like of policy algorithms, which uh, is uh, perhaps more practical. So what we want to do here is really like evaluate a certain target policy, right? So that's the one we're going to try and optimize. Uh, but uh, we, we hope to learn how to optimize this by following a different uh, behavior policy mu, right? So that's the behavior, the policy we're going to use to interact uh, with the environment, right? And uh, why is this useful, right? So there are many, many uh, scenarios where we may want to be able to do this kind of like off policy learning. So basically we want to sometimes learn from observing humans or other agents. So basically, you know, these agents or humans will have different policies. So they're gonna interact with these environments differently than uh, our agent will, right? But ultimately what we want is to find the optimal policy for our agent so it can act, you know, as well as these uh, other agents or humans. Similarly, we may sometimes want to be able to reuse experience. So generated from old policies. So 
in on policy learning, you know, you can only use uh, your, uh, you know, most recent, your current policy to generate data and learn from that data. But in op policy, right, you can imagine, uh, you know, using all of your previous policies, you know, so like the initial policy you started with, which may not be very good, you still want to be able to learn something from uh, the data generated uh, with that policy and so on for, uh, you know, every other policy that you see uh, throughout training. So that's going to make uh, these algorithms, these soft policy algorithms, a bit more uh, data efficient, hopefully. But of course, it's a bit, you know, it's not, um, uh, you know, as clear how to how to do off policy learning. But I'll explain uh, a few ways of doing this. And uh, you know, you can also you, there there might be other other reasons for which you want to uh, do off policy learning, like learning about the optimal policy while following a different exploratory policy or uh, learning about multiple policies uh, while following a single uh, policy. All right. Uh, so for this, sorry, uh, we have uh, what's called Q-learning, right? So again, uh, this is a very popular algorithm and you know we have modern algorithms like uh, DQN, DDQN and so on uh, that are going to be based off of this. And you'll see you know, tomorrow, hopefully that they look very similar to, to Q-learning. So what we want to do here, right, is like uh, to do op policy learning of Q values. So learn estimates of, uh, you know, uh, the value of a certain state and action. And uh, the idea is that we're going to take the next action using our behavior policy, mu, but we're all also going to consider an alternative successor action, which is chosen, chosen using our target policy, right? So that's the policy we want to optimize. And that's the policy we use to act in the environment. So then our update will look uh, like something like this, right? So the idea is that we're going to update, you know, our Q values towards this target, which essentially has like the immediate reward following, uh, you know, the action from the behavior policy. And then our uh, Q uh, value of the next state and action will be measured for the action taken by our target policy. So the intuition is that you kind of want to move towards, uh, you know, you don't want to update towards uh, like only what the behavior policy does, but towards what the target policy does, since that, that's ultimately right what you what you're trying to update. And uh, you know, so one uh, one way to instantiate this is to say, well, the target policy can be greedy with respect to the uh, Q values, right? So you just uh, say that uh, you know the best action. At this state is uh, simply the arg max over all the Q values for all possible actions, right? So you just choose basically the, the best action. And the behavior policy is a bit more exploratory, right? Which uh, we've, we've uh, said that uh, can help with uh, exploration. Um, so this is like an epsilon greedy uh, with respect. Sorry. Okay, so uh, so you have uh, right your behavior policy, which is epsilon greedy, and target policy, which is greedy. Uh, so then you can uh, write down your uh, Q learning targets in the following way. So it's just the the immediate reward that you get, right? Plus uh, the maximum over all possible Q functions. So that's quite nice, right? Because it it says that you're you know directly moving towards the maximum of all, uh, all possible. Q functions uh, at the next state, right? Over all possible actions. So for a bit more intuition, right? The way it's gonna look like, right? This Q learning update, again, you're trying to update towards this target, right? So let's say you're in uh, car uh, current state S, take some action, uh, get a reward. You're in the next state, right? And here at this point, instead of, you know, in SARSA, if you remember, we are just taking another sampling, another action from uh, our policy and using that value. But here we're actually gonna sort of like look ahead, right? And say, okay, what's the maximum uh, Q value that we might have at this point and use that uh, to do our update, right? So it's kind of like an optimistic way of uh, looking at things and trying to update with, uh, towards like, you know, okay, what's the best possible that we can do rather than, uh, you know, what's the, what's, you know, most likely thing that uh, our policy will do. So that's the way we do uh, off-learning uh, through Q-learning. 
So again, I'll stop here for maybe a second to see if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, so again, uh, you know, going back to the, the question asked before, Q, here we're starting to get into algorithms that are more commonly used, right? So things like Q-learning, uh, we're going to hopefully see a, a very end, uh, which is the deep Q-learning or like deep Q-network uh, algorithm tomorrow, as well as policy gradient and actor critic. These are going to look like, you know, very, very similar actually to the deep uh, RL methods that we use uh, in practice a lot. Okay, so let me now go to uh, what these kinds of like policy-based methods are, right? So, so far, we've mostly looked at value-based methods where we typically just try to learn a value function and based on the, you know, our Q functions, we can derive the policy, right? So we typically just take uh, the action that's, uh, you know, maximizes our Q functions according to our current estimates. And that's, that's what gives us our policy. But of course, we can also think about uh, policy gradient algorithms, right? So here, we're just going to say, okay, we just want to learn uh, this policy. So we can assume we have a policy by theta of a uh, you know, given uh, state and action that's parameterized by uh, you know, this set of parameters theta. And our goal will be to just find uh, the best uh, parameters that maximize a certain objective function, right? And what is our objective function? So our objective function, right, is as we've said, right, uh, it's, it's related to the return, right? The agent will ultimately want to maximize uh, its return in the environment. So one way to write this down is essentially uh, you know, kind of like a weighted average of uh, the value of this policy by theta at, uh, you know, any state uh, that we can sample from this environment. And uh, this, this will be weighted by what's called this d pi theta, which is a stationary distribution. So that's, that's just going to tell you, you know, how often are you going to be uh, in this state, given that you're following policy by theta in a particular environment, right? So this d pi theta essentially de depends on the policy, but also on the dynamics on the environment. So it can be quite tricky to, you know, if you if you don't know the dynamics of the environment, we can't really say what uh, what this is precisely. So we need to find uh, to basically, you know, ideally we want to get uh, get rid of it, right? And uh, what's nice about it is that we can actually do so. So uh, there's this policy gradient theorem, which tells us that, you know, when we take the gradient of this objective function. That actually, you know, doesn't depend on uh, the stationary uh, distribution, and in fact, it only depends on our Q values, right? Which we're sort of estimating uh, anyway, and uh, the log of uh, our, and you know, the gradient of the log of our uh, policy, which is also sometimes referred to as the score function, and you know, it's quite, it's, in some sense, it looks a bit similar to more like supervised learning algorithms that where you just do. Kind of like maximum, you're trying to maximize uh, likelihood uh, of this uh, uh, pi data. Okay, right. So that's you know once we compute. So basically, what this tells us, we can compute uh, the gradient of this objective function, and that's very nice because that gives you uh, you know the direction in which the policy should be, your parameter should be moving towards in order to uh, maximize this objective function. Okay, and just to go through some uh, kind of advantages and disadvantages of policy-based RL. So, you know, it's quite, uh, it has pretty nice uh, convergence properties because you're kind of like really directly optimizing for what you care about. You don't need to first learn a value function and then uh, learn a policy based on that. So that's quite nice. Uh, it's also very effective in high dimensional, uh, you know, action uh, state and action spaces. So in particular action spaces, right? So with the Q values, typically, I mean, it's easiest to, to deal with them uh, if you have a finite uh, set of actions, right? Because you can actually take the max and see, you know, what's the action that uh, maximizes your uh, Q function. I mean, there are like new, newer methods can also deal with like continuous action spaces, but it's still a bit more annoying to do that. Whereas in policy gradient methods, you, you don't care, right? It's just immediately uh, kind of transfers to that. And it also importantly allows you to learn uh, stochastic policies. Uh, you know, it's, uh, some, uh, for example, some scenarios like uh, if you imagine you're playing uh, rock, paper, scissors, right? The optimal policy there is to, uh, you know, kind of 
sample rock, paper, or uh, scissors every single time rather than have a deterministic. You can't play, if you only play rock, you're gonna lose, uh, you know, in expectation. Uh, so that's also nice. And that's uh, again, like harder to do with uh, kind of value-based methods. Okay, and some disadvantages, it can sometimes converge to a local rather than global uh, optimum and uh, can be a bit more high variance and uh, inefficient. Okay, so uh, again, we're going to use a previous concept, which is this uh, idea of like Monte Carlo rollout in order to derive a practical algorithm for policy gradient, which is this reinforced algorithm again, very similar to, you know, you're going to see hopefully tomorrow how uh, more modern algorithms like PPO or TRPO and so on uh, are just an extension of uh, this idea. So here, what you do is simply, you know, again, you roll out your policy for the environment, see what kind of reward it gets. And based on that, you can compute your policy gradient. And according to that, you can update your uh, policy in the direction uh, uh, which maximizes this uh, objective function. All right, so uh, again, uh, now just wanted to also cover briefly uh, actor critic algorithms. So the idea here is that, uh, you know, instead of just uh, modeling a value function or a policy, you can try to model both and we'll see why this is important. So here we can learn both a critic, that's like the Q function and an actor, that's basically our uh, policy pi theta. And similarly, you know, you can you can see that actor critic algorithms will use this kind of updates to uh, figure out, you know, how to move the policy uh, towards the direction in which, you know, the the value given by your estimated value function tells you to uh, to move towards. Okay, and one you know one way of instantiating and uh, really making uh, full use of these actor critic algorithms is this idea that. Uh, you can try to subtract a baseline function from the policy gradient, and that's not going to change your expectation, but it will reduce variance, right? So again, well, if we do a Monte Carlo rollout uh, in reinforce, for example, that's going to have really high variance, and in practice, it won't work uh, very well. But in fact, if you uh, use this trick, right? So instead of uh, directly using, you know, Q values, you can use this advantage function, which is just the Q value minus uh, the value of the state, then you get this new policy uh, gradient algorithm that's just, you know, really just the same as before, but instead of your Q function, you get your advantage. And again, you'll see that's, uh, you know, getting, starting to look very, very similar to uh, something like uh, PPO or, you know, at least like a part of the PPO update or other uh, modern algorithm that, that are, you know, very, very commonly used in practice uh, today. All right, maybe I'll just stop here and I think I'll uh, then I'll probably have to skip uh, model based RL and just uh, tell you a bit about some of the open problems in RL. Any questions? Okay. Uh, okay, then I'll, I'll wrap it up uh, soon. Okay, well, we're going to skip through this. Uh, yeah, and just wanted to tell you a bit about, you know, some of the open problems in uh, reinforcement learning. So these are both very classic problems, right? That are kind of fundamental to the uh, reinforcement learning uh, problem, but also challenges that we still encounter today, right? Even with uh, deep RL and so on, right? So that deep RL doesn't necessarily, I mean, it helps in, in some sense, but not uh, fully with these problems. So, you know, we have exploration, right? So the idea, how do we explore huge, huge environments, like uh, things like Minecraft or, uh, you know, NetHack or, you know, the web that's always changing. There are always new websites, new states, new things going on. So how can we possibly efficiently, you know, make sense of this uh, huge environment and make sure that we're exploring enough to, you know, see uh, new things that might lead to more reward in the future while also kind of exploiting what we already know. Uh, then, of course, there's the problem of credit assignment, right? So we, if we take an action now, uh, you know, we might only see the effects of it, you know, tens or hundreds of steps in the future. Uh, that, that's, again, something that is very common in some of these games like Minecraft or NetHack. And we need to sort of make sense, you know, figure out what or, which of the actions were crucial to getting that reward and which uh, weren't uh, as important. And finally, one problem that I'm uh, kind of like particularly interested in is uh, the idea of like, how do you generalize 
not only to new states in the same environment, but also potentially to entirely new environments, right? So again, you might have um, kind of layouts changing all the time on the web or uh, other environments like that. Uh, and you want to, or you know, you might have a robot walking in different kind of weather conditions or terrains, and you need it to uh, generalize and adapt to all these different environments in order to be truly useful for uh, real world uh, applications. And I'll uh, wrap it up here. Thank you very much uh, for being a great audience.